All right, let's start. Uh, uh, welcome to, to the second um, uh, installment of a Flavor uh, Parallel Sessions at uh, Lepton Foten. My name is Alexey Petrov. Uh, I'm from Wayne State. Uh, I'll be chairing the session. So every speaker gets uh, 15 minutes uh, plus five minutes for questions and uh, change of slides. I'll uh, let you know five minutes ahead uh, that you have five minutes left. All right. Our first speaker is Zuzana Gruberova, uh, uh, who is going to be speaking on behalf of uh, Bell 2 Collaborations, and she'll talk about Dow Physics at Bell 2. Please. Okay, so hello, everyone. Uh, I thank the organizers for inviting me to give the talk at this conference, and uh, my presentation will be about the Tau Physics program at the Bell 2 experiment. So uh, let me first talk a little bit about the motivation, about the teleptons. So teleptons are the third generation particles. They are the heaviest known leptons. Uh, and thanks to their mass, they can decay not only into light leptons, but also into light hadrons. And some new physics scenarios predict enhanced tau coupling to the new physics. But compared to the electrons and muons, the tau properties are known with much smaller precision. Uh, studying tau uh, decays and uh, tau properties uh, may possibly serve as a unique probe of intriguing topics such as the CPT conservation, lepton universality, CK immunitarity, new sources of CP violation, and also, for example, lepton flavor and number violations. And the key to addressing these topics with the tau, uh, tau uh, leptons are the high precision measurements. And for that, uh, the B factories, such as the Bell 2, are very well suited. So let me first say a few words about them. So B factories are energy asymmetric colliders, which means that the collision products are boosted. Uh, the B factory collision energy is at the epsilon 4 resonance, which is just above the threshold for the BB bar pair production threshold. But comparing the uh, production cross section for BB bar and tau pair at this energy, uh, we can conclude that the B factories are also tau factories. B factories of the previous generation, Bell and Babar, collected high luminosities of data, and the analysis of their data contributed with many interesting results in the last decades. Uh, um, in the program, uh, physics program of the B factories, there are precision standard model measurements, uh, measurements of the CP asymmetry parameters, and also searches for new physics phenomena such as lepton flavor and number violations, and of course, many other topics. The advantages of B factories are the well defined initial state, high vertex resolution, excellent calorimetry, and complex particle identification system, which makes them the great environment for the precision measurements of the teleton properties. Uh, now to Bell 2. Uh, Bell 2 is the B factory of the next generation. The Super KB accelerator is the upgrade of KB accelerator, and the first collision was recorded in 2018. Uh, it's a, a collider located in Tsukuba in Japan and uh, collides uh, 7 GeV electrons and 4 GeV positrons. SuperKegB is using the nanobeam focusing scheme at the interaction point and also uses higher uh, beam currents compared to KegB. The design luminosity is at the order of 10 to the 35 inverse square centimeters per second, which of course brings up great challenges such as increased background and higher trigger rates for which the new detector, the Bell 2 detector, has to be prepared. Uh, the Bell 2 detector is the successor of Bell. It has an upgraded trigger system, which allows for the selection of signals that were not possible to trigger at Bell. And it also has an acceler uh, excellent tracking efficiency and improved vertex resolution, which enables us uh, for new measurement approaches. Despite the global pandemic, SuperKegB managed to set new peak luminosity records in the past year. And this uh, luminosity uh, uh, rise above the B factories and also LHC levels, and they were achieved uh, as a product of beam currents lower than what was there and kept B. Uh, the milestones for the Bell 2 data taking are listed here. By this summer, we expect to collect 500 inverse centobarn of data, 
and the design, the target luminosity of uh, 50 inverse Eto barn uh, is expected to be reached by 2030. Now let's uh, move on the uh, physics analysis. Uh, for this talk, I chose to cover just a few of uh, them. So I will be talking about the tau mass measurement, tau lifetime, and also the lepton flavor universality tests with taus. So the mass. Uh, mass is the fundamental parameter standard uh, of uh, every standard model particle. Currently, the charged lepton masses are known with this uh, precision. And the tau mass is uh, truly an uh, important standard model parameter, and it impacts, for example, the LFU tests. At Bell 2, we are currently measuring uh, the tau mass using the so-called pseudomass measurement, which was also used previously at Bell and Babar. So I will uh, try to explain the idea. So this method was developed by the Argus collaboration, and it is using the tau leptons decaying to three pions and the neutrino. In this case, the tau mass can be expressed in terms of the momenta and energy of the three pion system and the neutrino. Since the direction of the neutrino is not known, the cosine uh, between, uh, of the angle between the momenta is set to one, and we get a formula for the m-min. And the m-min distribution is then fitted to an empirical edge function, where the position of the edge uh, corresponds to the tau mass. Here in the top plot, uh, there is a Bell 2 data and MC comparison of the MN distribution, and it comes from the Bell 2 measurement from 2020. And the lower plot is a close up of the cutoff area where the data points are fitted to the empirical edge function. The most challenging part of uh, this analysis is to find the most, most accurate uh, fitting function and to properly evaluate the estimator bias. The goal of Bell 2 analysis is to achieve the best precision measurement among the pseudomass measurements. Uh, currently, uh, the best result from the uh, pseudomass measurements uh, was achieved by Bell, and the world leading result uh, is by Best 3, and they used a different method for measuring the tau mass. The Bell 2 measurement from 2020 is agreement with the world average. Uh, it is statistically dominated, and uh, from the ongoing study, we see that the statistical precision of Bell and Babar will be reached already with uh, about 300 inverse center band of data. Uh, the systematic uncertainty of the Bell 2 measurement from 2020 is at the level of Bell, and in the current analysis, we are expecting significant reduction of the main systematics and also further improvement uh, of the reconstruction efficiency. Um, next important parameter of uh, the teleptons is its lifetime uh, and its uh, precision affects also the LFU measurements and uh, also, for example, the alpha S at the tau mass scale. Uh, the world leading measurement uh, is currently coming from uh, the bell uh, where they use the three by three event topology with both tau leptons uh, reconstructed in the tau to three pi new channel. The Bell 2 approach now is uh, different, so I will uh, explain the steps which are used in this analysis. So, in the first step, uh, we reconstruct uh, only one tau in the three prong, which uh, increases the statistics. Next, the tau momentum uh, is estimated assuming uh, both sides, both tau leptons decaying uh, hadronically so that we only have two neutrinos in the event. And uh, then the production vertex is found as the intersection of the tau momentum with the uh, IPY plane, which is, possibly, which is possible exclusively at Bell 2 uh, due to the tiny beam spot size at the interaction point. Uh, then the uh, tau lifetime is uh, extracted from the distance between the uh, production, verte production vertex and the uh, tau decay vertex. And the uh, most challenging step of uh, this um, 
this measurement is the estimation of the tau momentum and the subsequent reconstruction of the production vertex. Uh, the belt two measurements are currently done on uh, MC, st uh, MC simulation. Uh, the, from the result, we see that the competitive uh, statistical precision was reached already with a 200 inverse femtobarn. So the same statistic precision as what was at Bell. Uh, and uh, the resolution at Bell 2 is nearly two times better than uh, the one of Bell. The lifetime measured uh, the, using this method presents about three femtosecond bias with respect to the generated value. The reason for this are the ISR and FSR losses, which lead to the underestimation of the proper time. And this seems to be an intrinsic bias in this measurement. Further studies are being carried out to estimate the systematics, such as the dependence of the on the resolution function, the beam spot position, the ISR and FSR simulation, and also the vertex detector alignment, which was the dominant systematic uncertainty at the bell. Uh, and the next topic uh, I would like to cover is the lepton flavor universality tests. So uh, the three uh, lepton generations in the standard model differ by masses, differ by separate conserved lepton numbers, but the coupling uh, of the leptons to the W boson is flavor independent. Uh, so this is the standard model picture. However, as we already saw uh, in the many talks today and yesterday, Various experimental results presented in the past year suggest that this might not be entirely true and that the uh, lepton flavor universality might be violated. Uh, one of uh, such measurements are the anomalies uh, in the quark sector, such as RD, RD star plane, RK anomaly, and also P5 prime in B2K star mu mu, and there are more uh, mm. significant, sorry? Four minutes, sorry. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, significant tension is also observed in the lepton sector, in particular in the anomalous magnetic moments of both muons and electrons. Uh, lepton flavor universality can be also tested with tau decays, in particular the emu universality, uh, as the ratio of branching ratios of tau uh, leptonic decays and the tau mu universality using a uh, hadronic tau decays. Most precise measurements uh, of these variables come from Babar. The emu universality is in agreement uh, with the standard model prediction, and the tau mu result is 2.8 sigma below the prediction. Uh, at Bell 2, we already explored uh, different approaches with the uh, MC simulation studies. The idea is to use both three by one and one by one uh, tau pair events. So for three by one, uh, we uh, already perform better in terms of both purity and efficiency, where uh, the efficiency uh, on the Bell 2 simulation is already four times higher than uh, Babar. And the one by one events uh, were not uh, used at Babar, but are, but are possible to measure at Bell 2 thanks to the improved uh, and now very good trigger performance. The plots here um, compare the uh, performance of uh, Bell 2 to Clio uh, results in uh, purity and efficiency. Uh, the left plot shows the EMU channel where we are uh, able to perform better than Clio. And the EE uh, sorry, in the MUMU channel, uh, the performance of Bell 2 is very close. Uh, the main challenge of, uh, of this measurement is to select the signal with the highest possible purity. And for this, we are testing different lepton identification approaches, in particular, the BDT-based and likelihood-based lepton IDs. And for the one-by-one -one topology, we are employing the multivariate analysis techniques, uh, such as neural network and BDTs. And another important step is to reduce the systematic uncertainties, mainly the lepton ID systematics, which uh, was the main systematic source at Babar. 
uh, I've shown you just a fraction of tau lepton studies, which are uh, being carried out on the uh, Bell 2. Uh, apart from tau mass, tau lifetime, and LFU tests, there are ongoing studies on the VOS determination, tau electric and magnetic dipole moments, and also more lepton flavor and lepton number violation tests. So stay with us. Uh, exciting results on tau physics from Bell 2 are coming soon. And with this, I move to my summary. So uh, I hope I've shown that Bell 2 uh, provides an uh, excellent environment for the precision measurements and new physics searches in tau physics. Last year, SuperKegB set a new record in peak luminosity. And by the summer, we expect to collect data at the order of the Babar dataset. There is a number of toleton measurements uh, going on at the uh, Bell 2. I talked about the tau mass study, uh, which uh, aims to improve the uh, measurement uh, from Bell 2 from 2020. The, life, the tau lifetime measurement, which explains the potential of the nanobeam scheme and the upgraded vertex detection system. And uh, the LFU tests, uh, which aim for uh, delivering the world leading measurement of G mu over G e and G tau over G mu. And with this uh, uh, analysis ongoing and plans, uh, I believe that Bell 2 will be the major player in the tau physics in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Susanna, are there any questions? Well, while people are thinking of their questions, I actually have mine if I, if you don't mind. So I have a question about flavor, lepton flavor universality probes. So in particular, yeah, on uh, uh, slide 11. So the, the one that probes uh, tau mu universality, the branching ratio of tau decays versus uh, hadronic decays. Um, so uh, are you, you're, you're also, you, you're taking the hadronic decays from Bell 2 data as well, or will be taken. Uh, yeah, this uh, L, like we have a uh, one group which is uh, dedicated to this LFU tests uh, on Bell two, and we are like currently mainly focused on this uh, on the EMU university using the lepton decays because uh, for for this tau mu university yes we would need to extract the absolute branching ratio of uh, tau to hadrons whereas here in the um, in the ratio of the tau um, of the two um, tau decay ratios, uh, we'll have some cancellations. So this uh, measurement will be more challenging, and we first want to uh, really push this analysis. So uh, this is more in like in the early stage. Right. I mean, I, I wanted actually to say that, that there are also other other challenges associated with soft photons, for instance. Uh, soft photons affect the numerator of that tau mean universality ratio. Uh, much less than the effect uh, denominator. Denominator is the helicity suppressed decay. So every time you have a soft photon that you don't don't see, it actually is going to affect your denominator, not the numerator. So um, it's it, I, I was wondering how how you are you are dealing with uh, with those soft photon effects. But if it's if it's something in the future, I mean we can come back to that. And talk yeah, about right. Thank you. Thank you for pointing us out. Uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, this is still a early stage. Uh, this step. Very well. Uh, are there any other questions? I don't see any hands raised. Well, uh, thank you very much, Susanna, for a very nice talk. Um, let's uh, let's move on. So our next speaker is uh, uh, Andrew Edmonds. Hi. Hi. Excellent. Uh, Perfect. So uh, uh, Andrew, Edmonds, uh, Andrew Edmonds from uh, uh, Boston University will be talking about the MU2E experiment, the search for charge left flavor violation in muons. Please go ahead. I'll give you a warning, five minutes. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to this talk. I'm Andy Edmonds, a postdoc at Boston University. And uh, like Alexis said, I'm going to be talking about the MU2E experiment and our search for charge left on flavor violation in muons. So the first thing I want to say is that it's an exciting time for muon physics. Uh, just last year, we saw another measurement of the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon, 
And as we've seen a lot in this conference, there continue to be hints of lepton universality violation uh, coming from the LHC. And so what all this could be pointing towards is that the standard model is not fully describing muons. Uh, so when you look at uh, the standard model, one of the questions you can ask is why do muons conserve flavor? Because the quarks don't do it, they mix quite freely between themselves. The neutrinos don't do it, they oscillate between flavors over long distances. And so then the question is why don't we see muons and the other charged leptons violate flavor conservation laws? And so if you were to take the standard model with neutrino masses to explain those neutrino oscillations, the reason we don't see charged lepton flavor violation is because it's unobservably rare. And that's shown in the Feynman diagram on the left here. You have a muon uh, converting to an electron. This neutrino then is os oscillating in a virtual loop with a W boson, and you get a large suppression factor in the rate uh, because you're taking the mass ratio of the neutrino with the W boson. And so you end up with this completely unobservable uh, 10 to the minus 52. Um, however, many extensions to the standard model introduce new physics in loops or at contact terms, and this can enhance the rate of charged lepton flavor violation up as high as 10 to the minus 17 or 10 to the minus 15. And this is a rate at which we'd be able to see it with the next generation of charged lepton flavor violation experiments. And so then the point to make here is that any observation of charged lepton flavor violation would be clear evidence of new physics. And so one of these processes that we can search for is the neutrinoless muon to electron conversion, which occurs when a muon is in uh, orbit, in a 1s orbit around a nucleus. And this is a muonic atom which has a lifetime on, typically on the order of hundreds of nanoseconds. So when the muon converts to an electron with no neutrinos, the energy of this electron is just equivalent to the mass of the muon and then subtracting off some corrections for the binding energy of this 1s state and for the nuclear recoil of this nucleus. So this is a very simple signal to search for. It's just a monoenergetic electron coming from your muonic atom. And this, the current limit was set by syndrome two on muonic gold, and they set an upper limit on this RMUE of less than seven times 10 to the minus 13, where this RMUE is defined as the rate of the conversion process divided by the rate of the capture process. Okay, so mu to e is going to be improving on this limit by four orders of magnitude. And instead of gold, we're going to be looking in muonic aluminium. Um, and so our expected limit will be uh, eight times 10 to the minus 17. And this is a picture of our experiment. It consists of three main parts. There's a production solenoid, a transport solenoid, and then a detector solenoid. Um, so I'll walk us through this. Uh, we start off here with a pulsed proton beam that enters the production solenoid and hits a tungsten production target. This produces lots of pions. And in this graded solenoidal magnetic field that goes from four and a half Tesla to two and a half Tesla, some of these pions are collected and enter this transport solenoid, the S-shaped section in the middle. So as the pions are traveling around this transport solenoid, they decay to muons, and we have collimators in the middle of the transport solenoid to select the negatively charged low momentum muons that will stop in our thin aluminum foil muon stopping target. Uh, so the muons stop, these then form the muonic atoms. Those muonic atoms will then uh, decay, capture or convert. And the resulting electrons travel down the rest of the detector solenoid, which is in this highly uniform one Tesla magnetic field. And the momentum of these electrons are measured in the tracker and the energy of the electrons are measured in a calorimeter. And so our other main detector that's not shown here is a cosmic ray veto that covers the whole of the detector solenoid and half of the transport solenoid. 
Uh, okay, so we've got this very simple signal to search for. However, we do have some backgrounds. Uh, one of the main ones is when this bound muon in the muonic atom decays to an electron and two neutrinos. And this happens about 40% of the time for muonic aluminium. So if this was free muon decay, we wouldn't have an issue. Our conversion electron energy for aluminium is at 105 MeV. And free muon decay has a hard limit on the energy of the emitted electron at 52.8 MeV. However, because the muon is in orbit around the nucleus, the nuclear, the nuclear recoil modifies this energy spectrum. Oh, sorry. And so uh, there is still this peak at 50 MeV that uh, impacts the design of our detector, which I will get to later. Uh, but it also produces this tail. So the nuclear recoil can kick this electron above the 52 MeV free muon decay limit. And although you can't see it on this scale, this small tail is actually a background to the very small signal that we're searching for. And so this here is a plot from our simulation. So in red here is our conversion electron signal, now including resolution and energy loss effects. And this green histogram is the decay in, or this decay in orbit spectrum uh, coming uh, down. So you can imagine if the resolution was worse than this, the green histogram would be smearing to the right and the conversion electrons would be smearing to the left and we would lose our signal behind the background. And so it's very important that we have a high resolution momentum measurement. Which is what we get from our tracker. Um, so the way we do this is we minimize the energy loss of the emitted electrons by operating this detector in a vacuum and using low mass straws. So there's a photo of one of these straws on the left here. These are five millimeters in diameter and have 15 micron thick walls. And we then take 96 of these and over to the right, we put 96 of these into a uh, panel. And in this curved manifold, we read out the information on both ends of the straw to give us some longitudinal hit position information uh, that we can use in our uh, track fitting. We then take uh, six of these panels in uh, two sets of three, uh, and we put a large angle overlap uh, between those two sets uh, to again give us some uh, extra hit position information from the overlap of the panels. We then take 36 of these planes, rotating them all so that we get uniform coverage. And you'll notice that there's a big hole in the middle of our detector, which is to reduce background hits. And so uh, just going back to that big peak we see in the decay and orbit spectrum, uh, if we have our stopping target uh, in the center, uh, along the central axis of our detector, a 50 MeV electron in a one Tesla field emitted on the edge of this stopping target will not reach any of the active elements of our detector. And so that re greatly reduces our hit rate. Um, and then 105 MeV electron that we're looking for does extend far enough out um, to uh, be observed. Uh, this central hole continues through to the calorimeter, which consists of two disks of 674 undoped sodium iodide crystals. And we use the calorimeter for a fast en energy measurement, uh, which we use as a trigger. And we can combine that energy measurement with the momentum measurement to separate electrons and muons. And as well, the time resolution on the energy cluster is uh, good enough that we then use that to seed the track fit in the tracker. And so in the bottom right here, we have a photo of the module zero prototype that's been used in various test beams. Okay, so another uh, big background for us is from cosmic rays. So what can happen here is a cosmic ray muon uh, enters our experiment and interacts in the stopping target here, in the stopping target here emitting a 105 MeV electron that travels down the detector solenoid, creating hits in the tracker and the cluster in the calorimeter. 
So if we were to reconstruct this, we would see 105 MeV electron coming from the stopping target, and that would be completely indistinguishable from our signal. And we expect this to happen uh, once per day. Um, and so that means we need a cosmic ray veto that is 99.99% efficient to reduce this background down to a manageable level. And so you can see here, uh, these the cosmic ray veto consists of uh, modules of four layers of scintillator that cover the whole detector solenoid and half of the transport solenoid. And to give you an idea of the size of these modules, here is one of these modules being lifted up for a hanging test. Five minutes. Um, thank you. Uh, the final uh, set of backgrounds that we worry about are beam related. So uh, what we have is we have protons arriving at the production target, and then about 200 uh, or a few hundred nanoseconds later, in magenta here, we have prompt background. So things like uh, undecayed pions and beam electrons entering our detectors. And these could contain 105 MeV uh, electrons. And so what we do is we take advantage of the fact that the muonic atoms are forming with this distribution, but then decaying over this much longer time scale. So our signal is coming out over this dashed histogram. And we pulse the proton beam. So we have protons arriving at the production target every 1700 nanoseconds. And then we only record hits in a delayed live window. Um, so that completely removes prompt backgrounds from the proton pulse. However, we're looking for something so rare that if even a small fraction of protons arrive at the production target between these uh, pulses, then we would have a large enough prompt background uh, to hamper our signal. And so we need an extinction level, so the ratio of protons in and out of pulse to be less than 10 to the minus 10 to uh, minimize this background. Okay, so I've just pulled out a few uh, parts of the experiment. There's a, a lot more I could talk about. Uh, here's a photo of a lot of things being constructed and construction is well underway. Um, so for the schedule, uh, we'll be commissioning the detector first with cosmic rays and then with beam through to the end of 2024. And we're then going to take data on either side of the LBNF PIP2 shutdown. So we will take run one data in 2025 and 2026 and achieve a, a factor of a thousand improvement over syndrome two. And then we will resume data collection in 2029 to get that final factor of 10. And to show we understand our run one sensitivity, we recently completed an estimate uh, for run one with our uh, Monte Carlo simulation. And so if our MUE is greater than 10 to the minus 15, we'd be able to claim a five sigma discovery. And so that's the size of this uh, signal that's shown on the right here. And this would correspond to about four events. If we don't see a signal, then we'd be able to set an upper limit of six times 10 to the minus 16, which would indeed be a factor of a thousand better than the syndrome two limit. Uh, and then there's a paper on this that's been submitted to uh, universe. Um, so we have our signal region between these two red um, arrows here. We've got our decay and orbit spectrum, and then all of our cosmic ray and um, beam related backgrounds are right at the bottom here. And our total expected background for run one is 0.11 plus or minus 0.03, with cosmics and DIO being the largest contributors. Okay, so that's it. Um, so to conclude, MUTRI is going to be searching for the charge lepton flavor violating process of muon to electric conversion uh, in aluminium. Uh, and we'll be able to set a 90% confidence level upper limit of eight times 10 to the minus 17. Uh, the experiment is under construction and we'll be commissioning with BEAM in 2024 and taking data in 2025. So there's, and there's plenty of opportunities for new collaborators uh, to join us on this. Um, and so that's it for me. Thanks for listening. Any questions? Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much for such a wonderful talk. Um, <clears throat> are there any questions, as was asked previously? All right, I have 
if I may ask one, um, are you planning to have a positron run as well? Uh, uh, where does it fit in the run schedule? So um, we can actually take do a mu minus to e plus at the same time. So we don't need another data set. So the positrons will just spiral in the opposite direction. Um, so yeah, there, there are plans to do a, a mu minus to e plus uh, search. Excellent. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? I don't see any. Well, there is always Mattermost, so don't don't forget to use that uh, that thing. Um, thank you, Andrew. Again, you. Um, um, let's see. Let's let's uh, continue. Our next speaker is Matteo. Uh, Matteo De Gironi, right? So he will. Uh, yes. Perfect. So uh, he'll talk about the status of the MAP2 experiment at PSI. I'll give you five minute warning. Okay, thank you. I think uh, you already should see my slide, right? Yes, we can see your slide. You can. Okay, start. okay, sorry. Okay. okay, so my name is Matteo Gerone, and uh, I'm going to present you the status of the MAG2 experiment at uh, PSI. Um, this is the outline of my presentation. I will briefly tell you why we are looking for. Uh, uh, such a decay, even in even if in this conference there is a lot of uh, experts about these uh, topics, of course. And also, I will tell you why, uh, among all the possible channels, the muon decay is considered to be a golden channel. And then finally, I will uh, briefly summarize uh, the result of the MEG experiment and uh, uh, shortly describe the status of the MEG2 experiment, which is the upgrade of uh, uh, the MEG experiment. Okay, so first of all, why we are looking for uh, such uh, a decay? Basically, because you know the lepton Faber conservation uh, in standard model is just uh, an accidental symmetry. It's not needed by the model itself. And uh, nevertheless, if one try to uh, make some calculation about uh, a possible branching ratio, for example, for the MUI gamma decay, even including the neutrino oscillation and masses, uh, the number which one found uh, is a very small number, something like 10 to the minus 50, 10 to the minus 52, depending on the input parameters. And this means that, uh, uh, I mean, there is no background coming from standard model. Of course, you cannot measure such a kind of branching ratio. So this means that uh, any kind of observation of uh, such a process would be a uh, clear indication of new physics beyond the standard model. And of course, there are many theoretical models which predict this uh, kind of uh, decay beyond the standard model. So we think that this is a, a quite interesting topic to be investigated. So why in the moon channel? Uh, of course, uh, you can see uh, this uh, uh, lepton flavor violating decay in a lot of channels. Uh, but uh, uh, among all possibilities, uh, uh, we think that the Moon channel can be considered a golden one, uh, basically because uh, there are uh, high intensity and low energy beams which are easily available. And this means that it's possible to collect the high statistic you need for such a precision measurement. Uh, the beam handling is, uh, uh, of course, relatively easy. Uh, you don't need a uh, huge infrastructure to manage such a kind of, uh, of beam. You can have uh, uh, beams uh, both in continuous or in pulsed mode. And this is uh, uh, very useful because uh, uh, depending on the kind of decay you're looking for, you will need a different uh, beam configuration. And also the kinematics of this decay is very uh, simple. Uh, it has a clear signature, even if uh, inside a huge background, so it's quite easy to recognize such a decay. And moreover, the, the characteristic of the moon, mainly, mainly the, its uh, long mean lifetime, allows for long beam transportation, and this makes uh, everything a little bit easier. And uh, okay, as uh, some colleagues of mine already told you, Today, of course, there are different channels which can be studied. 
And all of these channels are supposed to be complementary among themselves. Uh, there is, for example, the movie conversion, we just heard about this. And there is also the mu to three uh, electrons decay. And finally, there is the mu to e gamma decay, which is the one I'm going you to uh, tell about in this presentation. So what about signal and background? As I said, the signal is uh, quite uh, simple. It's a two bodies final state with uh, an electron and uh, uh, gamma, which are produced uh, uh, with the same energy, which is the half of the moon, the uh, half of the moon mass. Uh, they are produced in uh, time coincidence and uh, back to back. Of course, we are supposing that the moon is, is decaying at rest. Uh, concerning the background, there are two sources of background. The first one is the so-called correlated one, which is given by the radiative moon decay, uh, where when uh, the two neutrinos carry away a small quantity of energy. And the other one is the so-called accidental background, uh, which is given by the uh, superimposition of uh, a positron coming from a Michel decay and a gamma uh, coming from uh, some other processes. Uh, okay, if you make some calculation, you find that uh, the accidental background is the, the dominating, dominating one because it scales uh, as the square of uh, the uh, moon rate. And this means that uh, a continuous beam is needed in order to reduce uh, uh, this uh, source of background. Uh, so, which is a site for a Muigam experiment. Uh, as I said, uh, you need a continuous beam. Currently, the world's highest intensity continuous moon beam is available at the Porsche Institute in Villigen, Switzerland, uh, with an intensity which is uh, uh, three times 10 to the seven moon per second, the one used in MEG, and uh, it can arrive up to seven, 10 to the seven moon per second in the MEG2 experiment. And then, of course, you need a detector with the highest possible resolution in order to measure the kinematics variable, which define your, your event. And those variables are the energy, the timing, and the relative angle of the two particles. Uh, in MAC, this is done by using a liquid xenon calorimeter for the full gamma reconstruction and a magnetic spectrometer for the positron reconstruction. And of course, uh, what one already needs uh, is uh, a full set of calibration. It's very important for uh, monitor uh, your detector uh, on a daily basis, uh, but even on a longer time, time scale uh, basis. So concerning the MEG experiment, uh, as I said, we used the uh, moon beam with the three times 10 to the seven moon per second. This beam was focused and stopped on a thin plastic target, which was placed inside a superconductive solenoid magnet, which is called Cobra, constant banking radius. Um, the positron momentum was measured by a system of drift chambers, uh, which were placed inside the magnetic field itself. Then uh, the uh, heat time is reconstructed by a uh, time encounter, which is a uh, detector based on plastic scintillator and uh, photomultiplier tube, uh, while uh, the gamma ray was completely reconstructed by a liquid xenon calorimeter, which is placed just uh, outside the uh, magnet itself. And the trigger <clears throat> system was based uh, on the information coming from the uh, fast detector, which mainly, which mainly means uh, time encounter and liquid xenon calorimeter. Uh, here, I, sorry, here I put just a couple of pictures just to give you an idea of the detector we use. In the, in the higher one, we found uh, we see the drip chamber system and the uh, target, which was placed inside the magnet. Then in the center one, there is uh, one of the two time encounters. We have two sectors, one upstream and the other one downstream uh, with respect to the target position. And finally, you can see the uh, liquid xenon calorimeter, I mean, the, the, the cryostat and the inner part with all the photomultiplier tube, uh, which uh, collect the light coming from the xenon, uh, liquid xenon. So MEG has continuously taken data from 2009 
till 2013. Uh, it collected uh, 7.5 times 10 to the 14 uh, moon on target. Uh, the analysis uh, of this uh, data set results uh, in uh, the currently the most stringent limit on a charge of the upper flavor validating process. And we found a branching ratio of the MUI gamma decay, which was lower than 4.2 times 10 to the minus 13 at 90% of confidence level. We uh, analyzed those data by using a, a Feynman and Cousin approach uh, using profile like recording. Uh, after that, uh, we started uh, upgrade uh, work on uh, our uh, detector. Basically, all the detectors were involved in this, uh, in this upgrade. The, the goal of this uh, work was to improve the uh, sensitivity uh, of about an order, uh, one order of magnitude. So we would like to arrive down to six uh, times uh, 10 to the minus 14 in three years of run by using the, the new uh, setup. All detectors were completely redesigned, like the drift chamber system, or strongly upgraded, like the uh, liquid exceeding calorimeter and the time encounter. Moreover, we also add a new, uh, a brand new detector, which is called the relative decay counter, and also we developed a new trigger and Yaku system. Uh, as I already told you before, the idea is also to uh, use a, a higher intensity moon beam. Uh, it was a three times 10 to the seven, and now will be seven times 10 to the seven moon per second. So this means that we have a, a 2.5 factor higher uh, moon intensity. So I reported here some uh, uh, highlights about the new detector. First of all, uh, the liquid xenon calorimeter. We uh, changed the part of the light detectors. So basically, we uh, changed all the uh, inner face of the calorimeter, which is the entrance face uh, for the gamma ray to the calorimeter. We moved from uh, a system based on two inches photomultipliers to uh, a system based on uh, silicon photomultipliers. This means that we had uh, quite higher granularity and uniformity in our detector, and this result in better energy and position resolutions. The final target resolutions are the ones uh, and the one written here. So we expect to have 1% of sigma in energy resolution and two or five millimeter in position resolution, depending on the uh, coordinates you are, uh, you are considering. Here in the, in the bottom uh, picture, this is an event display of uh, uh, two events uh, taken with the, the calorimeter. On the left one, you can see a, a photon reconstructed with the, the PMT's system as, a, as detector in the inner face, while on the right side, you can see uh, a similar kind of event reconstructed with the uh, silicon photomultipliers, and you can easily see that we are uh, much more precise in event reconstruction and also much more uniform in, in, our, uh, in our detector. Four minutes. Thank you. So uh, coming to the positron time encounter, uh, even in, in, this, uh, in this detector, we, we, we increase the granularity. Uh, in MAG1, we had a system based on a scintillating bar coupled to photomultipliers. We have 15 bars for each sector, while now, we have a system based on uh, scintillating tiles, we call them pixel, coupled to uh, silicon photomultiplier arrays. And uh, the, the, the number of channels increased by a factor 20. Uh, so again, we have higher granularity, but even much less budget material uh, across the positron trajectories. This is very important because allows us to exploit in, uh, multiple hits timing, and this finally results in a higher timing resolution. Uh, I, for example, I reported here in, 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 this, uh, in this plot, the results obtained during the MAG2 engineering run, uh, the single hit resolution is about 95 picoseconds, more or less. But considering then for it, that for each event, uh, you have at least nine hits, uh, you easily arrive uh, for, to a, a, 
have a resolution of about 32 picosecond, and this is exactly the design resolution. So we already achieved the resolution, the target resolution with this detector in MAG2 run conditions. Uh, this is probably uh, the, 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 how to say, the bigger upgrade that we did because uh, it's the one uh, concerning the drift chamber. The drift chamber were completely redesigned. Uh, now we use a single volume wire drift chamber system with a very low material budget and very high granularity. Uh, each cell is uh, uh, as big as uh, six millimeter with extremely thin wires. Uh, for example, we had the tungsten wire of, with diameter of 20 microns. And also we, we, we used uh, innovative wiring technique without any kind of feed through. Uh, I have to say, to be honest, that uh, we, we, we experienced some problems during the drift chamber commissioning, and those problems were related to wire fragility due to the presence of contaminants and humidity inside the drift chamber itself. But those problems were uh, fixed. And since the year 2020, uh, we were able to successfully run uh, the, the drift chamber with uh, uh, proper uh, gas mixture. And uh, those two plots you can see here uh, represents uh, the, the heat map and the heat reconstruction of uh, uh, events made uh, with the data um, took during the, taken during the uh, 2021, 2021, sorry, uh, data taking, which is just uh, finished. We, we finished this run uh, in, in, the, in December of, uh, of last year. So we are very fresh data, let's say. Uh, finally, we implemented even a new uh, detector, which is called the radiative decay counter, and uh, it is used for uh, reduce the background coming from a radiative wound decay by tagging a low momentum positron, and it is made by a system of laser crystals and plastic scintillators with the CPMs and outer. And thanks to this detector, we plan to improve our uh, experimental sensitivity by a 16%. Also, we implemented a new target monitoring system. Uh, the knowledge of target position is quite important because it's related, of course, to your angular uh, resolution. And you need to know the target position with a resolution better than 100 micrometer. And in order to do this, we use uh, uh, a system of photo cameras which take uh, uh, pictures, which are placed inside the magnetic, uh, the magnetic petrometer and which takes uh, a picture of the target time to time in order to have a comparison between a reference uh, position. Let's say. Finally, the trigger and the acoustic system, as I said, we developed a, a customized trigger and the acoustic system. Uh, they are uh, integrated in a single uh, board, uh, which is called Wave Duck. It's based on the uh, 5 gigabyte second per second DRS for digitizer chip together with a system of ADC and ATPGA, which allows for uh, uh, perform a complex trigger algorithm. Uh, moreover, this kind of board is very compact and very useful because uh, we can even provide a bias voltage and amplification to our CPM. So we can have a, a quite compact DRS system and together with even other uh, auxiliary tools. For example, we have also temperature monitoring system and so on. All this system was successfully operating during the 2021, 2021 engineering run. So finally, uh, as I said, uh, a full engineering run has just been successfully completed in the fall 2021. During this uh, period, all detectors run with full redoubt in the MAG2 experimental conditions and everything uh, went very smoothly. We were able to test different beam uh, detector trigger configuration as well as uh, uh, with as, other, as well as with other, um, many other calibration procedures, including a uh, charge exchange run dedicated for the liquid xenon energy scale calibration. So basically, everything is ready for the incoming physics data taking, which is supposed to start uh, in uh, spring summer 2022. Uh, as I said, we plan to reach the sensitivity of 6 times 10 to the minus 13 in about three years of run. So I hope to come back to you in the next years with some nice results. And that's all for me. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Mathieu. Very nice talk, uh, very thorough. Are there any questions? So while people are thinking, I actually have a, um, I have a small question. So uh, uh, there are some, there, there is some interest, uh, at least from a theory community, in uh, studying the decays uh, mu to e gamma gamma. That is to say, instead of mu to e gamma, mu to gammas. Um, is it at all possible to configure your, optimize your detector in such a way that uh, you can also be sensitive to that particular transition? Yes, uh, we already tried some, uh, how to say, to use the, the, the data take to, taken in MAG1. It's basically, it's possible, of course. Uh, um, we are working on it. I mean, it's not our uh, say mainstream, but yes, we can do something about this. And we are now making uh, some uh, simulation about the acceptance, basically, uh, about the two gammas in, uh, in, uh, in the calorimeter. But yes, uh, we think that we can uh, tell something even about this. Uh, this, uh, this like we don't have uh, our results right now, but we will have a look at this, uh, of course, yes. It's very interesting because it can also prop physics that is complementary to what you're probing in uh, mu to gamma. Yeah. All right, are there any other questions? Okay, no other questions. Well, thank you very much, Matteo. Yeah. Um, uh, just to remind you, there is a Mattermost. Uh, please uh, make sure that you use this uh, uh, to, to converse, to ask questions and so on. Um, all right, let's, uh, uh, let's uh, continue. So the next speaker is Dmitry Madigozhin from Dubna. Um, he will be speaking on behalf of uh, NA62 experiment and his talk is titled New Measurement of Radiative Decays at the NA62 experiment at CERN. Uh, Dmitry, I'll give you a five-minute warning. Please okay. go ahead. Uh, good evening, dear colleagues. I will give you the presentation about the radiative decays in the NA62 experiment. Uh, the K is a gamma decay. Uh, amplitude consists of the direct emission and inner Bremsstrahlung and their interference. Uh, the non-trivial part, of course, is the direct emission that uh, requires the theoretical calculations within the chiral perturbation theory. Uh, but in general, this uh, decay has a um, divergent amplitude due to the inner Bremsstrahlung component uh, at low energies of gamma and small angles between the lepton, between the electron, well, between the lepton and gamma. Uh, in uh, traditionally, the measurement and calculations for this decay is done in few different uh, regions, uh, phase space different uh, regions that are defined by the minimum uh, energy of the gamma, radiative gamma, and the uh, region of the angles between the lepton and gamma. And uh, what is normally measured is the ratio between the probability of the decay in this specific uh, phase space region to the total inclusive uh, probability of the K is decay, uh, including all the radiative effects together. Uh, in the table shown below the, uh, on the bottom of this slide, you see the definitions of three uh, regions uh, and the corresponding ratios, uh, R1, R2, R3. Uh, and the uh, theoretical predictions uh, from the chiral perturbation theory and results from the two latest uh, experiments. Uh, one uh, variable also uh, that may be a matter of interest is the T odd observable that is calculated from the momenta of, uh, of electron pion and uh, radiative gamma. Uh, and this, the asymmetry in the distribution of this variable uh, would, be a detect, would, would be a manifestation of the tier violation that is predicted within the standard model due to the one loop electromagnetic corrections uh, to be rather small, below 10 to the minus 4, while the, the only experimental measurement is at the level of, which has a precision of percent level. And there are no measurements for to another traditional regions of the uh, radiative decay. 
Uh, the NA62 experiment uh, is uh, located at CERN in the north area of SPS uh, accelerator, and it exploits the 400 GeV proton beam extracted from the accelerator. The main goal of this experiment is the K2 pi plus new new measurement that will be covered by the next talk. The detector was commissioned in 2015. There were physics runs in 2016, 17, and 18. Uh, and the first, re first uh, uh, physical result was uh, published yet, uh, and it will be uh, presented in the next talk. And the data taking is approved up to the CERN uh, long shot down three. The detector is, uh, as it was told, uh, it exploits the SPS proton beam that impinges the beryllium target. target. And uh, after that, we have a secondary beam uh, of uh, 75 GeV that contains 6% of charge counts. Uh, then we have a th Cherenkov threshold counter that helps to, to detect counts in the beam. And the giga tracker uh, that uh, measures the incoming cowan momentum. Uh, then we then uh, a system of veto uh, prevent us to uh, to select uh, multi-body events and uh, some accidental uh, combinations. Uh, and then the straw straw based uh, magnetic spectrometer. Uh, measures the, the momenta and positions of the charged decay products that are then identified by means of uh, uh, ring Cherenkov uh, system, by Muveta system, and also by the liquid krypton uh, calorimeter that is an electromagnetic calorimeter used to, for the particles detection as well as for the gamma quantum measurements. <clears throat> Uh, the strategy of the measurement uh, is very uh, straightforward. We just count the number of uh, detected events in the uh, signal regions, uh, subtract by, by ground, estimated background, and, and apply the acceptance and trigger corrections, and divide by the very same things uh, related to the uh, normalization channel. The uh, accept background estimation is done using the data for accidentals and Monte Carlo for the physical decays. The acceptances are taken from Monte Carlo. Uh, the uh, signal uh, and normalization channels share most of the selection criteria except for the radiative photons that leads to the cancellation of many systematic effects. Uh, the trigger efficiencies are measured with data and they are almost equal for signal and normalization because the trigger reacts mainly to the, only to the presence of the charged positron. And only statistical uncertainty of the observed amount of amounts of events is considered as a statistical uh, contribution to the uncertainty, while all the rest is considered as systematic uncertainty. The full uh, set of the data from 2017 and 2018 uh, was uh, analyzed. Uh, for the case regamma, we use the following selection criteria. The, we require that the, there is a uh, charged count reconstructed in Giga Tracker and associated to the tagger. Uh, then we have uh, three, uh, posit positron track reconstructed in the straw magnetic spectrometer and associated to the hodoscope, charged hodoscope, uh, rich and liquid krypton uh, detectors. Uh, the decays of pi zero are identified selecting two energy clusters in the liquid krypton calorimeter and applying the kinematic limits on the photon pairs invariant mass. Uh, the radiative gamma uh, quantum is in identified selecting one more in time and isolated energy cluster in the liquid, uh, liquid krypton calorimeter. The particle identification is done using the rich ring radius and the ratio between the energy deposit in the liquid krypton calorimeter and the uh, positron momentum measured by the, by the straw detector. Uh, the in-time extractivity in, uh, in V2s is not allowed in order to reject 
the uh, KE4 uh, uh, decays and to suppress accidental background. Also, mu veta uh, heats is not allowed to, to reject mu muons. Uh, additionally, the anti coincidence between the position of the radiative photon cluster in LKR and the position of track at the LKR plan are, is forbidden. Well, the anti coincidence is, is required to reject uh, the uh, KE3 events with a photon emitted from the inter interaction of the positron with the detector material. Uh, the additional dedicated uh, kinematic conditions are applied to reject uh, K3 pi and K2 pi grounds. And the final analysis is done using two missing mass observables. Uh, one is, uh, let's say, complete missing mass that, that takes into account the, uh, the gamma quantum, the radiative gamma. And the second missing mass is the missing mass calculated ignoring the radiative gamma. So uh, using these variables, we can uh, fill the plot of KE3 uh, normalization channel. That is a missing mass that ignores radiative uh, photon. Uh, we have the 66 million selected events, and uh, this is a very clean uh, normalization, almost background free. Uh, for the K is three gamma selection, we have the mine contribution uh, related background. That is an accidental contribution. It consists mainly on the events on the K is three events with a lost soft radiative gamma, or uh, the K two pi event with the misidentified pi, uh, plus additional good uh, liquid krypton cluster that imitates a radiative photon. Uh, first of all, we use a dedicated cut using the missing mass calculated, ignoring the radiative cam, radiative photon uh, that uh, rejects the KE3 with a negligible photon. And additionally, we uh, estimate the accidental background using the side bands uh, by uh, defined by means of the gamma uh, radiative, radiative gamma candidate time uh, sh uh, with respect to the time of the, of the other components of the decay measured by the same liquid krypton calorimeter. Five minutes. Yes, the uh, number of observed events are shown here. The precision or statistic precision is improved by the factor of three. The acceptances are also cal are calculated by means of Monte Carlo and the precision is corresponds to the needed uh, precision. Uh, the selected backgrounds uh, are shown on this uh, table. You see that the um, dominating contribution is uh, accidentals, while the other components uh, estimated by means of Monte Carlo uh, are almost negligible. And in total, the contribution, the background uh, contamination in all the definitions of the radiative decay is below 1%. Uh, here, on the next slide, you see the, uh, the, signal, uh, the signal distribution for the missing mass defined taking into account the radiative photon. Uh, and you see that uh, the signal is also rather clean and the accidental background and Monte Carlo estimated uh, physical backgrounds are also shown. And additionally, we have checked the sensitivity for result to the quality of the Monte Carlo simulation of this uh, of the energy tails. And in total, the background contamination is also below 1%. Uh, finally, the uh, preliminary results are shown on this table. Uh, you can see uh, that uh, our precision of our results is equal or better than 1%. And the mine contributions uh, are from, uh, from statistics, from, uh, uh, from, uh, from uh, simulation of the response of the Monte Carlo. Uh, and in total, we have uh, essential improvement. The state of the art is improved by the factor of two or three in, in terms of relative precision. But the, what is new is that uh, we have a relative discrepancy with the lattice theory, 
uh, of uh, of the or at the level of six to seven percent in all the three regions for the RDVB case. Uh, while for the R2 definition, the, our result is halfway between the two lattice theoretical predictions. Uh, well, also we have the preliminary uh, measurement of the asymmetry. Uh, it is uh, made taking into account the possible offset uh, calculated from Monte Carlo. And in all the cases, we have the T asymmetry precision improvement by the factor better than three, and the first measurement for the R2 and R1 definitions of the relative decay. So finally, the new preliminary results for K is three gamma decay is presented. The measurement of the branching fracture have been performed, showing six to seven percent relative discrepancy with the uh, latest uh, chiral perturbation calculations. The experimental rate of precision is improved by the factor of two to three, uh, and T asymmetry measurement have been performed as it is still compatible with zero, while the experimental sensitivity is far from theoretical expectations. And the first T asymmetry measurements is performed for R1 and R2 uh, definitions of the um, radiative decay. Thank you, that's all. Thank you very much. Um, uh, are there any questions for Dmitry? Um, I don't see any. Uh, uh, can I ask you something that uh, I, you know, I sort of claim my uh, ignorance? So the theoretical prediction for for T asymmetry is it done for for the whole kinematical range or? separately for R1, R2, and R3. Yes, all of, you can see in this table that the theoretical calculation is done separately for, uh, for R1, R2, and R3. The numbers right. are different. Yes, all these different, different, different regions uh, have somewhat different contributions, uh, well, relation between the inner Bremsstrahlung and uh, the direct emission contributions. So oh, I, I understand uh, that, but you know, I, I, I remember a paper from uh, someone from Novosibirsk who did a prediction for the whole kinematical range, not the separate, you know, parts, right? I mean, well, this, but uh, the, the whole for, for the whole kinematical range would be they, something, they something, range something range like absolute, it would be something like absolute branching while we are measuring the relative branch. Mm -hmm. we, we, we calculate the share of this uh, high. Uh, energy and high angles region with respect to the whole, uh, uh, to the total uh, branching. Right, but the, the asymmetry, the, C, the T violating asymmetry. Ah, T violating, you, you mean, yes. yes. Right, so so is it uh, the theory predictions, are they done for uh, separate selections? Sorry, I'm sorry. Measure or for the whole thing? Uh, uh, no, I, uh, unfortunately, I, I, unfortunately, I don't know. I know that, well, you mean, about theory at the very beginning, yes, there was just there was 10 to the minus uh, the, four the yes, there was yeah. just mentioned, yes, there was just mentioned that it is below 10 to the minus four. Uh, I cannot insist uh, that I know <laughs> in which region it is done. Maybe it is just maybe it is a for, for that whole region. I don't know. That's what I thought. I mean, so maybe there is there is a homework for us to, to do a calculation. Go for different reasons. Yes, uh, well, the, the actually uh, maybe yes, maybe for 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 experiment it is not problem. We can also do it uh, for the for the normalization. Ah, no, uh, we cannot do it for the uh, for the inclusive for the total uh, ke three because uh, our detector can measure only gamma quanta with an energy higher than something higher than. 3 GeVs, let's say. So uh, for us, it will be not so easy to. Uh, you see that uh, that for the, for the definition of this uh, T odd variable, we need to measure the gamma quanta energy. Yeah. yeah. No, no, so no. so we must measure it. So uh, so it it should be in some specific uh, phase space region. All right. Excellent. So there is some homework for us. Yeah. All right. Uh, are there any other questions for Dmitry? Uh, I don't see any. So thank you very much uh, for this talk.
Um, I appreciate that. Again, uh, please use Mattermost to uh, connect with your fellow uh, speakers. And uh, if you have questions, please do ask them. Uh, so the very last talk of this uh, uh, session is going to be a talk by Monica Pepe. Um, uh, this is, uh, let's see. Excellent. So uh, 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 this is a talk from Monica. Uh, she's representing NA62 collaboration from INFN Perugia. And she will be talking about measurement of the very rare K plus to pi plus new new bar decay. Uh, please go ahead. I'll give you a five minute warning. Good evening. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to give a talk at this conference. I will present the measurement of the very rare decay pi plus, K plus into pi plus neutrino anti neutrino in the N62 experiment at the CERN. This is the layout of the CERN accelerator complex in the Geneva area. N62 is a fixed target experiment using the SPS extraction line. This is a view of the N62 apparatus inside the experimental hall. The main goal of the experiment is the measurement of the branching ratio of this ultra rare decay with a 10% accuracy. However, the high performance of the detectors allows for a broad physics program. N62 physics run one took place during year 2016 to 2018. Uh, physics round two started the last July. We have been approved to take data until long shutdown three, very likely until 2024, to complete the panel new measurement and address new physics cases. The K plus into pi plus and new bar decay is a flavor changing neutral current process that proceeds at lowest order in the standard model through the electroweak box and penguin diagrams dominated by top quark exchange. The quadratic G mechanism and the top to D transition make this process extremely rare. On the other hand, it has a high sensitivity to new physics. The theoretical predictions are extremely clean, be dominated by short distance dynamics. The adronic matrix element can be precisely evaluated experimentally using the well-known branching ratio of K3 decays. Standard model uh, predictions uh, for, this branching, for the branching ratio of the two golden modes as given by this reference are shown in the table. The uh, theoretical uncertainty as shown in the diagram is dominated by those of the uh, CKM parameters VCB and gamma. The combined measurement of both neutral and charged branching ratio would be able to provide an independent determination of two elements of the unitary triangle as shown on this uh, figure. Several models beyond the standard models uh, predict large variations of the branching fractions for both neutral and charged uh, K2 pi new new decay. Largest deviation are foreseen in those models uh, with a new source of flower violation and weaker uh, B physics constraint. Therefore, can the case can provide a way for new physics searches that is complementary or alternative to the LHC. The status of the art, the charge of the decay has been first observed by the BNL experiment that uses the K on decay at rest uh, technique. The result is based on seven candidates and is compatible with standard model within errors. NA62 exploiting a K on decay fly technique has observed one event with data collected in 2016 and two events in 2017, giving uh, this combined upper limit for the bridging ratio. In the following Following, I will describe uh, the analysis of data collected in 2018, and I will give the combined result for RAN1. The N62 detector is schematically shown on this slide. Uh, the tracking system consists of a silicon pixel beam tracker that measures the can, momentum, direction, and time, and a straw double spectrometer in vacuum downstream that measures the same quantities for charged decay product. For the particle identification, a Cherenkov counter on the beam line identifies the K plus in the unseparated beam, while a rich detector downstream separates pi plus 
among the decay products. The photon veto system is used to reject by plus by zero background. It comprises small angle forward calorimeters, 12 large angle veto counters surrounding the fiducial decay region and the liquid krypton electromagnetic calorimeter. The mu veto system is located at the end of the detector after an iron wall. A charged anti-counter is used to reject the background induced by the inelastic interactions of the beam with the collimator and the giga tracker. And finally, the charged otoscope provides a fast track measurement for the charged trigger. The CERN SPS 400 GV primary proton beam uh, delivers an intense hadron secondary beam of positive charge, central momentum 75 GV with a spread of about 1%. The beam is composed mainly by pi plus with only 6% of K plus. The nominal beam rate at the giga tracker is 750 megahertz, while the K plus decay rate in the fiducial volume is about 5 megahertz. NA62 is a very challenging experiment uh, aiming to measure a decay with an extremely weak signature um, over the huge background of all other uh, K plus uh, decay channel. The decay fly technique and the high momentum count beam are the key factors of the experiment. The kinematic of the signal is schematically shown in this cartoon. The only measurable quantities are the K plus and pi plus momenta and the angle between their direction. The square and missing mass is defined under the hypothesis that the charged particle in the final state is a pion, allows to define two signal regions that are almost kinematically free from the most frequent background, and the variable is used to separate the signal from other K plus decays. The figure shows the squared missing mass distribution for the signal in red multiplied by a factor 10 to the 10th and uh, uh, that of backgrounds with the largest branching ratio. The two signal regions are separated divided by plus by zero peak, their boundaries depends on the squared missing mass resolution. These are the required performance for uh, these measurements. The analysis of 2018 uh, data that corresponds to about 80% uh, of the total sample benefits beside of the increased statistics of the following improvements. The analysis performed in seven separate categories uh, that are defined depending on the hardware configuration and uh, momentum. The 2018 sample has been split in two uh, subsets, S1 and S2, corresponding to the period before and after the replacement of the final collimator. The the subset S2 has been further divided in six uh, categories. The selection is optimized separa separately for each category, improving the signal efficiency with respect to previous analysis. Furthermore, particle identification and upstream background rejection are performed using a multivariate analysis. Both signal and uh, normalization channels requires uh, the presence of a downstream positive charge track defined as a pi plus and the K plus parent track that form a decay vertex inside the fiducial volume. After this common selection criteria, uh, specific requirements defines the signal and normalization samples. For the signal, the selection uh, requires K to pi match, by plus identification for muon rejection, photon and multitrack rejection, and kinematic cuts based on the squared missing mass. The selection is then optimized in means of charged pi and momentum. The figure uh, shows the squared missing mass distribution as a function of the pi plus momentum for minimum bias events that are selected without requiring the pi plus identification and the photo rejection. The two signal regions are shown together with the background regions from the three main uh, backgrounds from K on the case. Control regions that are used to validate the background estimation are located between the signal and the background ones. The signal and control kinematic regions are masked during the analysis to avoid the possible bias in the uh, optimization of selection criteria. 
the branching ratio measurement relies on the calculation of the single event sensitivity that is computed uh, in uh, uh, each uh, category. The combined the single event sensitivity for 2018 data is 1.11 times 10 to the 11, where the contribution to the 6.5% relative uncertainty are listed on this table. The number of expected standard model signal events is obtained using the theoretical predictions for the standard model branching ratio, and this introduces an additional external error. The background contribution uh, to the pine new signal uh, arises from two different processes. Count the case inside the fiducial volume, but to final state different from the signal or events occurring upstream the fiducial volume that we'll describe in next uh, slide. Uh, the background from count the case is estimated using a data-driven estimation, assuming that the rejection for the three main background from count the case are independent of the square missing mass. And the same procedure is used for signal and control uh, regions. Here, uh, the pi plus pi zero case uh, in the signal region is described as an example. After applying the pine selection, the number of expected background events inside the signal region is given by this expression, where n pi pi is the number of events in the pi plus pi zero background region surviving the pi new selection. And f kin is a kinematic factor given by the fraction of pi plus pi zero events inside the signal region, but measured in control samples. The figure uh, shows the, Monte the data to Monte Carlo comparison for the squared missing mass distribution uh, in a pi plus pi zero sample selected uh, using control minimum bias uh, data uh, without any assumption on the pi plus kinematic variables. And this sample is used to compute the kinematic factor uh, for uh, the signal. The same procedure is used for the KMU nu and the K23Pi backgrounds, while these other backgrounds are evaluated only using Monte Carlo simulation that are normalized to the single event sensitivity. The upstream background is due to events in which a charged pion is produced upstream the fiducial volume generated either from early K plus decays and then the charged pion is matched to an accidental beam particle or uh, from interaction of the K plus with the material in the beam line and then the charged pion is matched to the in time K plus. These are dangerous if the P plus scatters in the first row chamber and generates a fake decay vertex inside the fiducial volume. K to pi association geometrical uh, cuts are effective in reducing this background. This is evaluated as well using a data driven approach. Since the geometrical origin of these events allows to define samples enriched in upstream events for background validation. The figures shows, show how the installation of the new collimator is effective in reducing the upstream background in the S2 uh, sample for 2018 uh, data. The table uh, shows the background estimates uh, for the two subset summed over the two signal regions for different contribution. The upstream background is the uh, highest contribution to the total background that is estimated to be 5.42 events with these errors. The total background uh, prediction is validated in six control regions through blind analysis. And after unmasking the control region, as seen in this figure, the good agreement between the expected and the observed uh, number of events uh, validates our background evaluation. After opening the signal box, 17 candidates are found, four events in region one, 13 events in region two. They are shown on the squared missing mass versus pi momentum plane together with the number of events observed in the background and uh, control regions. The table uh, indicates the number of observed and expected signal events together with the expected background events in the three years samples. The combined results from run one uh, corresponds to 20 events observed in the signal region. In the hypothesis of background only, a p-value of 3.4 times 10 to the minus fourth is found corresponding to 3.4 uh, sigma uh, statistical significance. 
to compute the branching ratio, the 2016, 2017, and 2018 all collimator samples are considered as one category each, integrated over momentum, while the 2018 new collimator sample is split in six categories, corresponding to five GV bins of pi plus momentum in the range between 15 and 45 uh, GV. Uh, the figure uh, shows uh, for the nine categories the number of observed data and the corresponding number of expected background events with their errors. The branching ratio, a 60% confidence level, has been uh, found using a bin at the maximum log likelihood fit that used the signal and background expectation in each category. And uh, uh, the result is 10.6 times 10 to the minus 11 with this uh, uncertainties. This is the most precise measurement of the K2 uh, pi nu decay rate to date. It gives the strongest evidence so far for its existence. Even if a large branching ratio deviation from standard model are excluded, at least the time stream proof the precision is needed to match the theoretical uncertainty, and this will be reached hopefully by run three. Uh, the result has also been interpreted in the framework of the search for a new feebly interacting scalar or pseudo-scalar particle X produced in K plus decays in 2 pi plus and X. This has the same signature as the pi nu uh, that in this case represents the um, dominant background. I have no time to discuss the result. I only want to say that improvement on previous limits have been set over most X masses. And then in the uh, scenario in which X is a dark scalar mixing with the X, new exclusion limits have been set in the uh, plane defined by the coupling and the, the scalar mass. And these are my conclusion. You can read it yourself. I only want to say that RAN2 just started with important hardware improvements to further suppress backgrounds so it, this will allow we improve the signal sensitivity and uh, NS62 is excellent prospect for new physics measurement with a broad program. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much Monica. This is a very exciting result um, uh, once the theorists understand it. Uh, uh, this, this is great. Um, are there any questions? Oh, all right, I don't see any. Uh, can I ask you about uh, something that is uh, sort of a background to your, to your, to your result? <clears throat> so um, since, you, since K plus to pi plus uh, pi naught is your, is your dominant background, can you put constraints on, uh, pi naught, on the branching ratio of pi naught to invisible? Ah, I mean, yes, I, are you, are you mean for, sorry, you mean for, the, um, for that result? Well, yeah, I mean, for, since you, you, you try to exclude it, I mean... Uh, yes, yes. As you see, these are the limits uh, oh, that oh. are done in independent analysis for Nepi not to invisible. Oh, this, but this is in the context of, uh, what is this mass of the scalar? Oh, this is a pi, right? I mean... Yeah, this, this is the mass of the pi. scalar, yes. The mass of the scalar, this is uh, 10 to the minus one, and this is in a logarithm scale. And what is the sign, theta? Uh, Santita is uh, uh, 10 to the minus six. Right, but uh, so is it the CKM angle? What, what is that? Sorry, can you? What is sine theta? What is this parameter? The para sine theta is the, the mixing parameter of the scalar with the Higgs. Oh, with the Higgs, I'm sorry. Okay, so that's yes. for a particular model, okay. Yes, 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 it's a particular model. Is this model, the BC4 model, mm -hmm. in which uh, product, production and the case uh, are uh, uh, considered with mixing with X. It's just for this particular model. This uh, assumes uh, that uh, the uh, X decays only to visible standard model particles. Right, but I mean, in general, uh, so if pi not decays to invisible, I mean, it could be two, two dark photons or... I don't know, uh, two dark scalars of, or not scalars, but two, two dark fermions of some type. Of some type. Uh, uh, I mean, re regardless of the model, you can you can put the model independent uh, uh, bound. Oh, yes. I think that this has been visible. discussed in some other talk in some other parallel session today. Oh, OK. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions? Well, this is amazing. We actually finished not just on time, but uh, yeah. earlier. Yes. 
So uh, I would like to thank all of the speakers for being very disciplined. This is honestly the first time in my life that happened, that people ended, you know, their presentations, what, almost 10 minutes ahead of time. This is great. Uh, are there any questions to any other speakers uh, that we had today? Well, okay, if not, uh, again, I encourage you to use Mattermost uh, for, for, for the discussions. Uh, that would be it for us. Thank you very much to all speakers. Uh, let me do the uh, this. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I'll see you uh, uh, at the other talks.